The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi, everybody. Welcome. We're going to wait just a minute or two to get started and let some folks that might be coming in late get here. Thank you. Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Happy Halloween. Welcome to our webinar on 2019 GAP reporting standards, trick or treat. This presentation is for churches and faith-based organizations. My name is Peter Wagner. I'm the director of marketing here at ACT2. We hope that you find this session valuable and I'll try to get us going quickly. We've got a pretty packed agenda. First off, thank you all so much for joining us. Let me get some housekeeping items out of the way. Um, if you have questions during the webinar, you can type those questions in the question box and the GoToWebinar panel should be on the right of your screen. Um, they've done a user interface upgrade, so it doesn't look exactly like what we have there in the, on, on the screen, but it's similar. We'll try to get all those questions answered uh, at the end of the session. For any questions we don't have time to answer, we will follow up with you afterwards. You are going to also receive copies of both the recording of this webinar as well as a PDF uh, uh, of the presentation that we're going to go through today. Uh, additionally, Cape and Krauss has provided a handout that they recommended we distribute, and you'll get a link to that as well in the follow-up email. So we are offering CPE credit um, provided by Act 2 via the Texas Registry of CPE. That credit may not be valid outside the state of Texas. Um, Everyone will have the ability to complete a survey at the end of today's web webinar, which is re a requirement for CPE. And you're also gonna receive um, our CPE number and a certificate of completion in the follow-up uh, email after the webinar is over. So uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with Act2, we are a partner and value-added reseller of Sage Intact Financial Management Software. We were named Sage Intact's overall partner of the year for the last five years. We also provide managed accounting services where we take on all or some of an organization's finance and accounting function. And we use Sage Intact as the platform for those services. Um, we have a specific focus on churches and faith-based organizations and understand the unique needs of uh, church finance departments and other not-for-profit organizations. Um, if you have any questions or like any more information, you can visit us at act2.com. About Vision 2, our partner in today's presentation, Vision 2 believes generosity is a fundamental part of worship. As a comprehensive giving, giving solution, uh, Vision 2 will enable your church to enhance and grow contributions as an extension of worship and discipleship. And as the only giving solution that doubles as a contribution management system and acts as your payment processor for gifts, Vision 2 helps consolidate and simplify all of your processes to give you the most time back in your day to focus on your mission. Um, if you have any more questions or like to find more about Vision 2, please visit vision2systems.com. And about our speakers today, Carl Tierney, 
has been working on financial systems for most of his career in both for-profit and not-for-profit markets. He's built and integrated financial systems for NASDAQ, Nationwide Insurance, Wells Fargo, and Chase. In 2006, he started working with nonprofits, running the professional services team and designing solutions for some of the world's, uh, the largest nonprofits in the country, including organizations like Hafer International, World Vision, and Save the Children. As the current CTO, Carl co-founded Vision 2 Systems to build a giving solution that understands how to connect with members as well as serve the needs of the finance teams of the church. Vision 2 currently manages over $4 billion in contribution records for its customers and will continue to inspire generosity for their growing network. Uh, Tammy Bunting has led an impressive career as a director of finance and a CFO during her 30 years working in the nonprofit industry. In 2002, she began working at a megachurch in Dallas, Texas with a $50 million budget. During her tenure as CFO, the church grew to five campuses, a thousand acre camp, a TV ministry, and an association of churches. In 2012, Tammy partnered with Sage Intact to help churches and nonprofits gain efficiencies and ease the burden of managing their finances. In 2014, Tammy joined Act Two as Director of Not-for-Profit Services, and through her commitment to this role, Act Two has served more than 150 churches and nonprofits with financial management software solutions and managed accounting services. So we welcome Carl and Tammy, and we really appreciate the two of you sharing your expertise today. Let's take a look at our learning objectives. The session is going to cover uh, the following topics. We'll learn what changes to gap reporting are coming and how they affect churches. We'll find out the risk and consequences of inaction, and we'll learn the steps you can take to minimize the burden of these regulatory changes. So. Without further ado, I will hand the reins over to Carl Tierney. Carl? Thanks, Peter. So uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about the gap changes for 2019. Uh, Peter, if you could advance us to the next slide. So there's uh, a couple of things um, that have changed that will impact us um, in, in our world. Uh, one is, is the change to net asset classification. Um, so we've always operated with three. We're gonna be down to two in terms of kind of the way we're doing gap reporting. Um, the disclosures regarding appropriations, designations, or similar transfers. Um, we'll talk briefly about that, um, but we're not going to spend a lot of time on that because it really doesn't affect us much um, in the church space as much as it would if we were running uh, kind of more of a, a nonprofit with an endowment background. Um, the expiration of capital restrictions um, and kind of the changes to the rules for that, and that really does apply to us because um, that's a big change and something we should be aware of. And then kind of the disclosures around availability of funds and liquidity and, and how that impacts our operating cash flow statements. Um, and the key focus, like if you boil it all down to what's changed for us around 2019, is really kind of a shift from uh, looking at this uh, in terms of kind of just what is cash on hand in terms of kind of looking at our um, financial viability um, and credit worthiness and a shift to liquidity, right? And the, and the way to think about liquidity very very simply is, what is the cash that is unrestricted that I have available to pay current expenses? Um, and so that's the way to think about liquidity. And so liquidity is gonna be this measure that we're gonna be looked at in terms of kind of how we're evaluated in terms of the strength of our, 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 our financials. Um, so it'll be, it's kind of a shift from just looking at cash overall um, to a shift on focusing on liquidity. So uh, Peter, next slide. So to help kind of break this down, uh, Sammy and I uh, tried to put together kind of like um, a, a, a narrative, kind of walk through kind of what would happen if you go through this process. Now, in, uh, and, and again, with that focus on liquidity at the end. Uh, and the way to think about this process is, is that everything that we do up front in terms of kind of our planning and organizing our financials and organizing the way we accept contributions all results in kind of changes in that liquidity number. So we're gonna, we're gonna walk through our tale of two churches um, in 2019. So we've got two different churches here. We've got Valley Gap Church and Church on the Hill. Um, Valley Gap, the CFO has you know, uh, spent some time understanding what the changes to Gap and realizes the evaluation for credit worthiness will be based on this new liquidity concept. Valley Gap has three campuses, one building campaign that they will finish this year, and then they'll be making a major expansion next year in which they're going to be looking for uh, additional financing. Church on the Hill is like, oh, you know, I don't have to do anything about this. I'm just going to do it the same way I've always done, and it'll all be okay at the end. 
very similar construct, three campuses, one building campaign, and again, we'll be making that major expansion next year. And so we're gonna use these two churches as a framework to kind of walk through the decisions we can make in terms of kind of preparing our organization for GAP and how that would show up at the end. So uh, Peter, next slide. So let's start off with the changes to net asset classification. So we used to have three groups, right? Everybody remembers our restricted, temporarily restricted and unrestricted concepts. Um, the change to GAP here is, is that everything that has a restriction is restricted. And again, the way they're looking at this is, can you use those funds immediately or not? And so from a, a liquidity perspective, that's why they're, they're driving these two buckets. So we're gonna end up with a big bucket that is literally just all restricted and it doesn't matter when it actually releases or if it ever releases, it's just all considered restricted because you know, from a gap perspective, they're saying, you know, if the, if the uh, donors or the giver's intent was really, you know, to a specific fund or a specific campus or a specific, you know, a specific use, then it doesn't matter whether we say that's temporarily restricted or, or, or restricted, it's still got the initial indication that the, that the, the giver actually restricted those funds. So um, that's kind of the major shift in the change to net asset classifications. Uh, next slide, Peter. Uh, Carl, before you go to the next slide, just a quick sure. clarification. One of the things that we struggle with, and I know you're going to address it later, but when we talk about donor restrictions, sometimes the donor can be very specific, and sometimes our own terminology will put a donor in a position where they restricted their funds when they didn't have to. So terminology like what's your commitment versus um, as God provides. There's different terminology we can use to help guide the donor to give without putting those specific restrictions on it. Yeah, thanks, Tammy. And she's absolutely right. So the more we want to, as we think about how we present information and the terminology that we use to present to a, a member when they're making giving choices, we want to be as general in our language and our framework in which we communicate to them. We don't want to be telling them that they're giving to you know and a good example of this is when we use the word funds right if we if we say we're giving to this specific campus fund what we're indicating to the member as an example is is you're giving to this campus and those funds are going to be used at the campus but in actuality what we really mean in, in most cases is we're not really trying to give to the campus we're really trying to say I need to be able to do campus-based revenue reporting, both in my GL and in my giving, and I need to understand that that revenue is associated with the campus because that helps us to understand we use giving as a, pro you know, as, a, um, as a proxy for figuring out attendance, the health of the campus, right? So we use child check-in and we use giving, and we use a couple of other things to kind of give us an idea how well a campus is doing. But one of the things that we've, we've historically always had to do is say, well, look, if I don't put a campus fund up there, then, you, then I don't know that you've meant to give to that campus. And we, we want to talk about how we can leverage, you know, tools and technology to still get that campus-based reporting, but without actually indicating to the member that they're giving to a specific fund. So if you look here, we're talking again about our, our two churches, our tale of two churches. So we have Valley Gap Church. And so the CFO there is going to make the designation as more general as possible to avoid having the donor think that those assets are restricted and indicating that those assets are restricted. So we're going to pull the word fund out of there. And instead of saying, you know, main campus fund, we could say main campus offering or even better yet, just campus offering, right? Or the tithes and offering or your offering, right? The more general we make that language, the more, the, the, the less argument that anybody can have, including our auditors saying that, well, you know, you kind of have been putting all of this in this, you know, these campus-based funds. And made it very specific. So if we can take that down to a single fund for all campuses, but still get that reporting that we want, that's ideal. But in you know if we can't do that, then we, we probably at least ought to pull the word fund out. So we've got Valley Gap Church, which is basically going to genericize their giving. They're going to they're going to shrink their campus funds into a single fund. They're going to move the reporting on on revenue to campus to their back end tools. And we've got Church on the Hill, which just says, oh, I don't have to do anything. I'm going to leave it as is, right? And so as we're going through this, what we're doing is we're building up all of the kind of infrastructure and the data classification and the giver and the donor's intent. And then we're going to see how that impacts our liquidity number at the end when we talk about what happens to that number at the end for these two organizations. So uh, some uh, so next slide, Peter. Peter's already ahead of me. Awesome job. Uh, so the changes to net asset classifications, you know, we're going to reformat it. You're going to see 
It may be a little hard to read on the screen, um, but the, the goal here is to basically kind of indicate, well, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna have two classifications of assets in our balance sheet. We're gonna have with donor restrictions and without, and donor restrictions, again, are anything that basically a donor says, you can only use these funds for this, or even temporarily for this. Um, but another important thing to note about this, um, and this is really where the strength of your financial system and a little bit of planning can help you a lot. If we can allocate expenses correctly, as we think about those assets, whether they're restricted or unrestricted. So take, for example, um, I have, uh, you know, a pro somebody who's basically functioning, you know, they help manage the facilities for my church. Um, we have them on payroll, but they're spending about 30% of their time um, working working on you know, the building modifications that we're making, the, the general construction that we're having, and I've got funds that are restricted to that, I can take that person's salary based on how much time they're spending over there, and I can allocate it to those restricted funds, drawing down the cash in those restricted funds with that, and, and basically improving my liquidity. And again, this is all part of our planning and thinking about how, how expenses work, and we'll talk a little bit more about that here in a few slides. Peter, next slide. Um, so the other major thing is, is uh, so all of us have experienced, you know, the building campaign and then having to deal with restricted funds related to that building campaign, which we release over time based on the, the planned use of that, whatever that building effort was. And so we'll then generally start to release those restricted funds um, over time. This is a major shift in kind of the way GAP has treated this. So we used to have to do that, but now the new standard is as soon as that particular building or project that we've got restricted funds uh, against, right, are now going to get released as soon as that is in service, right? So a big thing for us, especially when we're doing, you know, we're expanding our facilities or maybe building a new campus or building a new church, you know, we'll go through this process of creating this building fund and then we'll get to a point where we say, okay, you know, it's in service, it's in use, and we used to have to keep those restricted funds that we had left over and basically spread them out over time. The big change with GAP 2019 is those immediately become unrestricted and shift over the unrestricted thing. So it's something to think about as you plan or even in looking at what you currently have in terms of kind of restricted funds, you may be able to release some of those funds as you move into 2019 based on the new GAP standards. Peter, next slide. Yeah, and Carl. Carl, one oh, thing sorry. with that is, yeah, this is Tammy. One thing, just as you mentioned that, I remember I would use the debt to try to release some of that as well. And even though the donor didn't, you know, restrict that capital campaign and say, I don't want it to go towards debt, in order to release that, I would use the debt service in order to do that over time. So it's nice to know that I don't have to spend time allocating that out over time that as soon as it's placed in service it can be released that's that is a great improvement so it will be uh, and thanks Tammy for that because that's that's awesome that's a great I mean as Tammy's describing that's an awesome opportunity for us to kind of reclassify the way that we've been treating some of those assets that have been restricted in the past um, so it, it gives us a, it gives us a big advantage in kind of helping us to look at liquidity as we move into 2019 um, and, the other, and, and I, I hit on this a little bit earlier, but one of the other big changes to GAP is to be clearer about how our expenses are classified, a natural classification. Um, but in addition to that natural classification, which they're now asking us to report, you know, so salaries, utilities, supplies, you know, think about kind of the natural major categories that you've got expenses in. But we also, in terms of thinking about how we drive our liquidity numbers up, should be thinking about how we allocate those funds. So how can I allocate those expenses back to restricted categories um, so that I don't necessarily pull that out, uh, all those funds out of my liquidity number, right? So if I can allocate expenses correctly, I can end up with a better liquidity number than if I just pull all of those funds out of my unrestricted cash. Does that make sense? So yeah. uh, Peter, next slide. So let's talk a little bit about how this might work, right? So Valley Gap Church has a building campaign that's finished in April, building its first use in Maine. The building campaign had $20,000 remain in the CFO, allocates some staff salaries and expenses that are appropriate for January through April and basically moves $15,000 of expense that would have come out of unrestricted and applies it to the restricted as a result. But we also have the remaining building funds from the restriction moving back $5,000 back to unrestricted. The Church of the Hill um, didn't do any of the allocation. And based on using the old time-based release is only gonna release about $5,000 of that $20,000 remaining campaign or remaining building fund. 
into kind of covering general expenses. So they're going to end up with about $15,000 that is still locked up in restricted funds. So even though they have the cash, it's not going to actually contribute to their liquidity. Next slide. So again, uh, thinking about liquidity available, this is kind of what happens, right? So we basically have a, a certain set of assets that are available, um, cash or whatever on hand, and we're literally going to subtract all the donor restrictions away. Anything uh, going back to if the board says I'm moving ten, you know, or your elders say I'm moving ten thousand dollars out of, you know, out of general funds to basically go into the building fund, those would be uh, board basically designations or restrictions that we would add. And so literally the liquidity is going to be kind of the calculation of what do I have on hand that is unrestricted? Um, and that ends up being kind of my unrestricted uh, cash on hand available. So just again, keep thinking unrestricted cash is liquidity. That's the way to kind of think about that um, in terms of kind of a, an overall viewpoint. Peter, next slide. So let's talk about, so this is kind of the capstone slide of our tale of two churches. Um, and it's important because I wanted to talk through kind of what happens if we don't do all of that setup work up front correctly, right? So we've, we've made sure that there's no way that the giving could be classified as temporarily restricted to a campus um, in Valley Gap Church. So we end up with 1 million in total unrestricted non-campus designated based giving. We have $200,000 in cash after operations in 2019. Um, we have no restricted or temporarily restricted funds remaining, so we end up with 200 cash on hand and a liquidity of 200K. We take the same numbers, right? But 500K was specifically given to campus-based funds. So essentially people went online and they picked their fund and they gave to it, right? And there's another group of people that literally just put the check in the basket and gave it. And so we don't necessarily have to classify it as that campus because the, the donor didn't actually indicate. So Church on the Hill ends up with $500,000 in restricted funds. That means they've only got $500,000 that would end up in unrestricted. They have 15 k of building funds that remain restricted. And in the end, while they do have 200 k in cash on hand, their liquidity is only 85 for 85 k because 50% they, they, of that cash is restricted to campus funds and 15 k is restricted to the building. So literally, even though the two organizations are fundamentally exactly the same, with fundamentally exactly the same revenue stream, because we didn't do the upfront work and thinking about how GAP changes the way that we classify liquidity and, and net assets at the end, we have two wildly different numbers that if we went to the bank and said, look, and they said, well, I want to evaluate your liquidity, one is going to look much stronger than the other, but they're both basically the same organization. One just made sure they did the prep work up front to make sure that they allocated expenses, correctly handled um, you know, uh, releasing capital from uh, restricted funds correctly, they allocated their expenses correctly, and as a result, they ended up with a much stronger liquidity picture than the organization that didn't. So as we think about that, you know, that's kind of why all of this stuff, all of these changes really kind of boils down to kind of driving that one number, which is liquidity. Um, so, uh, uh, Tammy, do you have any uh, other comments that you'd like to make? Just one for clarification. I think in the new gap, where you've got without donor <laughs> restriction and with donor restriction, where we're talking about board designated, the new uh, ruling is just to add the board designated as a disclosure. So the disclosure, the amount and the purpose of the board designated, along with the nature and the amount of the donor restriction becomes part of the disclosure. But part of that liquidity is only part, including the donor restricted, not the board restricted. Just to want to make sure as you were walking through that to make sure the audience realizes that board designated is not part of the donor restricted liquidity calculation. Thanks, Tammy. That's a very important point to make. So I think uh, next slide. So uh, Again, thinking about gap evaluation steps, you know, how well does your financial system support kind of the new gap standards? And you're going to probably uh, think about classifications and how you may want to set that up differently than you have before. Um, and then Tammy's going to talk a little bit later about how you might even, depending on the capability of your systems, actually keep two separate sets of books. One is kind of the way that you've always done it, and then one is kind of the new gap way as you help kind of go through transition. Um, another big piece of this is how. Can, how effective are we in classifying and allocating expenses? 
So the more effective and thoughtful we are about classifying expenses, again, that kind of shifts costs around. If we do have restricted funds and make sure that we draw those funds down when we can appropriately uh, based on the way that the donor actually indicated the initial restrictions. So think about you know, how we can allocate expenses, salaries, travel, all of that stuff when it's appropriate to restricted funds. How can we allocate those expenses so that we don't end up drawing down our liquidity number because we haven't done an effective job of expense allocation? Next slide, Peter. So liquidity reporting the, the big thing that I got out of kind of looking at you know the new gaps standards and some of the materials that we'll be sending out that have even more detail than the presentation we're covering today um, is really cash is no longer uh, cash in the way that we've always thought about it you know we used to always be evaluated about how much cash we have on hand and to a degree you know I think the shift in gap and what they're trying to do is, is trying to get organizations to kind of more focus on that liquidity what cash can we actually spend on on whatever the organization needs versus what cash is restricted um, and then thinking about, you know, what is our cash position and being able to accurately report that uh, does include near term, near term cash receivables, consider accrual for expenses so we don't end up with kind of a fluctuating liquidity number that, you know, spikes real high in, in, in December because we've got all that revenue coming in. And then, of course, you have that fund payment processing expense that, you know, shows up in a big pile in January and draws your January liquidity number down. So think about, you know, how can I allocate those expenses, kind of where revenue is occurring to help smooth out that liquidity um, and kind of uh, clean up some of those numbers. Um, with that, I mean, I think that's kind of the, uh, hopefully you, you've got the, the message that most of GAP 2019 is literally around prep. You know, you can choose to do nothing, right? But the impact of that is, is it'll drastically alter that liquidity number at the at the end of the year in 2019 or at the end of your financial year. So um, hopefully that was helpful. So with that, I would, wanted to kind of show um, um, uh, a little bit about how we might, um, hopefully I've got the right screen up here. Peter will confirm if I've got the right screen. Can everybody see my screen? Yep, looks good. All right, cool. Well, so um, this organization that I'm showing you here is a multi-campus organization. Um, and so that's the way it's been set up. Um, but the important point to note is they basically have a campaign here um, that they've got set up and they've got a general um, giving piece here where they're not actually trying to say, look, give to any one of our you know, six campuses or three campuses, it's just give to the one specific campus, right? And so. The process of going through this, if we go through and we create a gift and we, we check all the way out, um, and I'll go ahead and uh, speed this up a little bit so I'll log in. So one of the nice things about kind of a, a more robust system is, is that, you know, I already know that Kevin is associated with the campus downtown. So you notice I can do support our ministry, still know that the campus revenue is gonna go against campus downtown. And I can complete his gift um, and have that show up um, financially against um, against kind of what I'm expecting, right? So I'm expecting that that's going to show up uh, associated with a specific campus. So here I'm just going to quick uh, pull some uh, some general ledger entries here. Um, we'll create a ledger post file here. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and grab that. There we go. And so you'll notice I've only got a few entries in here because I only had a couple that were outstanding, but you're no gonna notice that I've got gift revenue already associated with specific campuses. I also have the payment processing expense associated with specific campuses. And the benefit, and again, I didn't have to do anything with a campus-based fund. I could use a general ministry fund and essentially accomplish, you know, kind of the allocation and the reporting of campus-based revenue, but with a very, very general fund description, right? So I didn't have to use a fund restriction or a fund in order to drive that output. I literally can just say, I'm just associated with the campus. I can still report by it if I want. I can put the campus all the way into intact or into my whatever general ledger system I'm, I'm using and still have that campus as a first class way for me to report revenue. Um, and I didn't necessarily have to do it by having uh, the member indicate a restriction up here or indicate that they were giving to a specific campus. I still have campus-based giving, but without the restrictions. So there are capabilities and tools and leveraging tools. We can help kind of drive kind of a, a more robust 
still getting all the fidelity that you want from a revenue reporting, but without kind of indicating that the donor is giving to a specific campus. So that's uh, just uh, one example of how you might use technology to do that. And so I'll, with that, Thanks. I'll turn it over to Tim. Carl, wait, one second. Before you leave the screen, here's, in this situation, what's really cool is this compelled by love. It's a restricted campaign. It's a building campaign. So in this situation, you can actually um, record it as a restricted donation, but still know that it was given by a specific um, campus uh, member or attendee. So in a more robust, you can actually record the restriction in your general ledger as a donor restriction based on them picking this fund. And in this case, it really is a fund, but you can also get the location. So that, so you get it both ways there. I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah, thanks, Tim. That's, yeah, absolutely. So um, we're going to pop over here and just look at it from a real quick perspective uh, from a financial platform. Right here, I'm using Preston Trail Community Church, and I've got a dashboard here where I can look at financial statements just like what Carl did. My giving can come in by location. Just because it's by location doesn't necessarily consider it restricted. This is ministry fund general giving for a specific location, not donor restricted. Based on the language that you have out on your website, all, all we want to know is who's giving to a specific area because that's where they're attending. And obviously, we want to offset expenses to those locations, but we do not want that to affect our liquidity based on a donor restriction. Um, also, the other thing I was going to show you is, is for those uh, situations where you do have restricted funds, you want to be able to track, there's, there's different views. I've got this one view, so for example, that Compelled by Love, we can have um, inception to date, all revenue, expenses, and you can even add in any kind of property equipment as we start purchasing things or, or construction, we can add that and the amounts that are left in the total would be whatever's left that would be considered restricted cash. You can have it in that format or you can have it in an extended format where you can literally list out the expenses. And that's where I want to talk a little bit about because as Carl and I were talking about this, I was hyperventilating just a little bit to think I am going to spend a lot of time trying to allocate expenses because I don't do that today. I don't necessarily track the salaries of the facilities person. Um, so some of those things I'm going to have to be mindful of. Most other expenses, anything that like the uh, credit card fees, all of those, those are easy to identify. So some of these things that aren't so easy to identify, I need to spend some time and figure out based on I could do an allocation per month based on square footage. There's they're in the um, Cape and Krauss handout, they give you some recommendations there. Um, the one thing that I thought of is that I also know that management, executive leadership, may not want to see those financial statements in the way that were required by GAP. So there's, there's another way to kind of skin the cat. And if my daughter was on this webinar, she wouldn't like that because she's a cat lover. But at the end of the day, there is a way that you can create unique books in intact. I don't know if that's something that other systems will do, but what I thought was I may create an allocation book where for gap purposes, I would create an allocation for wages, create allocations potentially for insurance, anything that I can think of that's going to help release some of those restricted funds, I can create an allocation book so that when I'm pulling up my trial balance, I can, which I'll just view real quick here without an allocation. As I'm bringing up this trial balance, it's going to include whatever book totals that I asked for. All the reports on my dashboard, I can ask it to include an allocation book. So when I'm preparing financial statements for the executive leadership, it can exclude all of those allocations because they don't want to see it that way. They want to see exactly just was what came in and what went for construction. I don't want to know how many salaries and all of the other things that we might want to include in order for our liquidity look, to look better. That liquidity is number one for your audit statements. 
but also for your lenders. They're going to start looking at it from the gap perspective with that liquidity, and they're not going to be just looking at your overall cash. So you can create these uh, segregated books that you can record those allocations and consolidate your regular accrual with your allocation when you're doing your gap statements and exclude it when you're creating your management reporting. I wish this was an open forum because I'm, I'm sure there's lots of questions and I would love to hear some other people's comments, but Peter, are you seeing any questions come in? There are a few questions, Tammy. Um, one of them is, what if we are not audited? Do we still have to, quote unquote, release restricted funds as you've described? If you're not audited, you still have to do it for the liquidity if you're asking for any lending, if you're preparing any formal financial statements for a bank. Um, but if you're not preparing gap statements other than for the banking purpose, the answer is yes and no. I would do it yes if I was um, intending to borrow any funds and required to present them in the gap format or if it if you're never audited and you have have no reason to present gap statements then um, it wouldn't be a requirement okay um, a few more questions uh, here's one do we need to do accruals for expenses every month or could they still be done at the end of the year this is how we do it today operating on a modified cash basis Again, I, I think that all is uh, relevant to how you present to your um, financial institution. If you're presenting financial uh, statements to your institution monthly, then I would definitely want to have an allocation book that records all of those for liquidity purposes. Or if you do it quarterly, um, then I would do that quarterly. If again, you're not presenting any GAP financial statements to any other institution and you're not being audited, then I would not go through the allocation of expenses for liquidity. But I suspect a growing church or any growing nonprofit, you, if you adopt these early on, then you don't have to transition and try to, you know, fit it in later. And if you create those allocations at the point of a transaction or create monthly allocations, you are already positioned for that time when you're going to be audited or when you need to go to the bank. Okay. Um, another question is, we've been talking a lot about churches. Is, is this only for churches or is this for all 501c3s? This is for all 501c3s. We use the church because we have a lot of churches and this is an easy example, but you would translate the liquidity requirement is for all 501c3s. All nonprofits. Okay, great. Uh, looks like we've got a few more coming in. Um, can you use wording on your website and your envelopes that funds will be used wherever most needed? Yeah, that, that's a great uh, language. Um, a lot of churches, it's hard. They want to say commitment or um, your specific gift to this specific purpose. Um, but having the where needed means that the church has full control and it's not donor is not restricting it the donor is giving up that control to the church and they're going to um, apply those funds where needed so that that terminology would be great okay great so that would release it from the donor restricted there would be no donor restricted funds in that using that terminology okay uh, here's another one. What do we need to do right now that may be more urgent versus what do we need to do in January? Um, what can we wait to worry about until later in the year? What I, if you already are tracking your temporary restricted and your, you've got permanently restricted and unrestricted, the first thing you could do is just change the terminology from with donor restriction to without donor restriction. Um, the next thing would be to make sure that funds are coming in and being applied directly to the revenue as a restriction. And if you could, instead of waiting to release those expenses, just the, the normal expenses, go ahead and assign them to that, that, that designated fund. So, for example, we have some churches that say, oh, we don't, we don't make our ministry leaders pick any kind of fund. We have that happen a lot. 
I would slowly start trans, you know, training your staff to know if in fact they are um, causing an expense that is part of a restricted fund. Be, allow them to start thinking that. I would start doing that as soon as possible if you're not doing that. If you are in the back office trying to pull that all together later at the end, it would be nice to have your ministry leaders already be thinking about what, what things are they spending that are, are part of the restriction. The hard one that I would love to see us start transitioning is working with our leadership. I don't know how many times, and, and I don't know if the folks from Preston Trail are on the, this webinar, but even when we talk to the marketing department regarding language to the audience um, or written documents that say commitment, even when it's not the intent of the leadership to put such a restriction on a donation, we need to start um, having those conversations with our finance committee to let them know that it's even more important now that we get the language that we're communicating to our members to um, remove that restriction, any language that could lead into a restriction, and, and get the leadership to buy into how important that is. And if anybody figures out a good way to communicate that, let us know. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think to, just to kind of summarize what, I, I, you know, from my perspective, I think the, only, the major things are, you know, prepare and think about expense allocation, how you might uh, allocate expenses, um, which is, you know, again, just to kind of reiterate what Tammy said. Um, it's much easier to plan for it up front than it is to try and react at the end of the year when you're trying to clean it up or when you have to present something to a bank. Um, the other, I think the other thing that Tammy hit on, which is, is, is again, is, is think about language that you're using to speak to members about in terms of what they give to. Because um, we don't want the member to think that they've, that they've made a restriction or are restricting funds because it's really the member's perception, not our perception. And I think that's a key point. It's the, the giver's perception of whether the funds are restricted or not. It's not necessarily ours unless we've been very, 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 very explicit saying that this is going to be used for general use. So again, the language matters um, and what we communicate to the, to the member or the, the giver is, 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 is how that is determined. It's not, it's not necessarily just what we think, it's literally what the member thinks. So be, co be, be cognizant of that. Great. Um, got, a, got a few more that we'll try to get to. Um, here's one. When creating an allocation set of books, what are the implications of that in the future when all restricted funds have been exhausted and are now part of the general budget? Will it send the allocation to general fund after those restric restricted funds have been used? Will it send it to the... Once it's released, an allocation book could then be included. You're out. You would include that allocation book in all of your reports because as you're releasing those expenses, no matter which book it is, it's automatically releasing it. Um, the only um, the only act that you would have to actually release funds would be, for example, when a capital uh, campaign was complete, placed in service, and let's say you had a hundred thousand dollars left over. And the new rule means that we can release those. Then we would create a journal entry that would move it from one, it can be moving it from one book to the other, but we're the act of releasing it. We can even release it within the allocation book. And once that's consolidated with the accrual book, it's completely released. So the, the most important thing is to make sure any um, residual restricted funds that are now um, available to be released then um, we would make that journal entry from one fund to another, the gen from the whatever capital campaign fund to the general fund. You're just doing a fund transfer to release those. But you could do that within the allocation book, and then when those books are consolidated, it's recording that full, fully released amount. Um, I thought of something else when I was saying that too. Um, shoot, can't remember. It's Halloween. I've ate too much chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> I've all of you already bought, like, yeah, like, you know how it is. I've 
there was something on Facebook the other day that says, make sure you go back to the store and replenish all the chocolate you've already eaten. And that's me. Um, but yeah, <laughs> <laughs> carry on, Peter. Uh, okay, here's the next question. Can you show the final financial statement at the end for the statement of changes in net assets? Do you still do one line net assets released or do you show the expenses in the donor restricted column by type? Donor restricted. I would show the expenses in the column of the donor restricted showing it being released if that's what the person is saying. So for example, um, let me show my screen. Oh. You want to show my screen, Peter, real quick? Back to you. Here you go. And it's all yours. It's in it. Okay, I'm just going to pull up this big report that I have. So, for example, these are all the restricted funds. You can see that I've got the revenue that comes in and the expenses by category, and I also have my fixed assets. So, if you're looking at the example that we had compelled by love, my net position right now of restricted funds is 1.5. That everything else has been released because the revenue and the expenses have been recorded against that specific fund. If that, I hope that answers their question. If it doesn't, um, you guys are welcome to, to reach out to me and I'll make sure that any follow up questions get answered. Um, we still do have a few more questions that I'd like to try to go through though, Tammy. Uh, here's one Would, okay. Wouldn't it also help? to have a different income account for restricted funds? You can, I have one that's called restricted giving. Um, so when you're doing your trial balance, let's see if I have my trial balance here. You don't have to, but it is, I think if you talk to the professional service team at Act Two, they do like having those separated just so that you can see it on your trial balance. At a quick glance, someone can see restricted giving versus um, ministry fund or general giving. But that one account, restricted giving, doesn't tell me which funds. So that's when you have your um, dimensions, your departments or your ministries. You want to have that context added to that uh, transaction. Now, for those that are in older legacy systems, they would have to have restricted giving um, with a um, more context than they could. They may have 12 restricted natural accounts because they don't have the dimensionality that intact. But yes, you can absolutely um, track it as a separate natural and associate it with a fund, a specific fund, which is basically what I have here. All of these are my funds going across the top that are restricted with one giving account called restricted giving. Anything else, Peter? Yeah. Uh, how is liquidity presented in the statement of financial position, or is this presented as disclosures? It is, and I we have examples, but it is in the disclosures. Okay. So the um, let me show you real quick here if we still have this one up um, on the balance sheet. For example, if you see mine, you've just got your with donor restriction and without donor restriction, and you still have your cash up here. Um, but when you do your actual audited statements, there's a section that literally maps out your liquidity. Okay. Um, here's another one. Uh, did I hear correctly earlier, after a building campaign ends, you can just release the, the restriction on excess campaign funds? Do you need to communicate this to donors up front? I don't think we have to communicate it to donors up front because, but that's a great question. I will, I will um, ask Cape and Krause. That's a good question. I would, what do I you would, think, Carl? I would, I would reclassify it. So I wouldn't say you can release it at the end of the campaign. You can release it no, when that, yeah. when the original purpose of the campaign, in this case, we can say, you know, I'm building a new building or I'm doing an addition. When that addition or building goes into service, so essentially I'm yeah. using that, that is the point in time which those funds get released. Um, 
according to um, both what was uh, in Kitten Kraus and kind of what I've been able to get and, um, and learn more about this particular issue, there's nothing that says at that particular point in time we have to notify the members that those funds have been released for unrestricted use. Um, so I think, it, you know, the, the goal was is, is, is to say, I'm going to, once that building is in use, I probably, and I think that's probably the way that they were thinking about redesigning the standard, they were looking to say, look, you're going to have general other expenses that show up after that building is in use. And so to a degree, like saying like, you can't, like, if I build a new building um, and I put it into service and, you know, I have to make a repair on it after it goes live or some of those things, or, you know, I paint it or I've got utilities to pay with that. Like, I think the purpose and the intent was is to not make the new changes to the way that they've done restrictions so burdensome that it like um, disincentivize you from like doing them in the first place and, and, and putting that building into use. So I think, I think it's a little bit while they've been a little harsher in terms of kind of the language and the restrictions and driving this liquidity number, I think that was one of the things that they actually relaxed to make it a little bit easier for us to manage kind of the expenses out the door. Okay. Um, Peter, yes. one thing that Glenn is, Glenn is texting me, um, Intact has new reports that measure liquidity. He actually has been working on those um, and they are ready for me to review. So that's with this new standard, Intact has been already building some of those structures for us. So I haven't seen them yet, but he says they're ready. He said soon. Great news. He said I'll need to review them with you soon. <laughs> so I'm excited. Cool. That's great. That's, That's great. Um, how about another question, Tammy? Do you typically uh, use a revenue account for a transfer of funds or, or a release of funds? I actually use an expense because I don't want to have revenue skewed. I, even though you know you're moving it around and it's a negative and a positive, I, I like it below the line, but I've also seen it above the line where you're going to have a contra account uh, in the revenue. You can have it both ways. I usually prefer the expense. I put it below the line. Okay. Uh, another one just came in. Wouldn't you release restricted net assets as you make progress billings before the building is placed in service? Oh yes, you're going to you're going to release them as the bills, but this is once the project's all done and you still have a hundred thousand left. You've put once you've placed it in service, you can release the re the remainder amount. But yes, you're, you should be releasing it all along as the bills come in, correct? That's a good problem. Good point. Yes. Yeah. Um, were you just showing the gap statement or is that what you have right now, Tammy? Someone asked, is that the gap statement? This one here, it is, it is in gap format, yes. Okay. But it's just in intact. I also was going to show real quick if we have a second. I've built cash flows. So even someone mentioned about the liquidity. I also built cash flows so that I can see my operating versus my restricted. And I literally use these cash flows to compare to budget. Um, so they, so that I'm in tune with my liquidity even before I'm doing all that liquidity. If it takes a second to pull up, you can see that I've actually built a cash flow where I've brought in statistics, I use just general giving, I've created a report group that, and this entire, you can see it's only operational, so I've created dimension groups that are excluding anything restricted, and it will give me my net increase and decrease in cash, but I can actually look at specific uh, revenue types and expense types. So I'm looking at the true cash that's available for operations with an actual to budget, and a forecast. So even an intact, just like someone mentioned, is liquidity and no, yeah, that's a true statement, but you can also build a report right out of the gate that you're looking at that for your own management purposes. Okay. Um, another question just came in. I recently went to a training last week that said you could not release any of the restricted funds until the building was placed in service. Can you confirm which is correct? Well, that's what we are saying. You can't release the funds until they're placed in service. So if we've, that's what we are saying. Not when the campaign's done, when it, the construction is done, when it's placed in service. I guess that is a correct statement. 
And that's what we thought we were saying. Okay. Say it again, Peter, just to make sure I understood. Um, basically, a training uh, said that you could not release any of the restricted funds until the building was placed in service. Is that correct? That is a true statement. That is a true statement. If we the, accidentally the thing, said, mm -hmm, go ahead. I was going to say the only thing that I would, I would, uh, and we go back to what Tammy and I were talking about around expenses, and where Tammy said, like, as we're oh. going through doing the building. There are expenses I may yeah. incur that should be applied to those restricted funds as I go. So what yeah. you can't do is say, you know, what you can say is I had to buy, you know, uh, I had to pay the general contractor $10,000 and I can pay that out yeah. of the restricted building campaign fund. What I can't do is say, yeah, and the senior pastor salary I paid out of that, right? I can't, right. I can't do that scenario, right? So I could do the scenario which says I got to pay the general contractor. I have somebody who works on facilities for my church. I'm allocating some of their salary over there, um, but I can't say, well, and as CFO, I'm going to put my entire salary into the fund. You can't do that piece, the CFO salary fund, like that would make sense. But you can. So as you go through, you know, even as you're still raising money for that campaign, you can spend it on the intended restricted. Yeah. Unit. But what you can't do is I, say, oh, yeah, and I'm going to take a whole chunk of that money and pay another bill that has nothing to do with the building, right? Like, that's the that's the part where um, I would say that, yes, you can't release those restricted funds until the building is in use. And then at that point, you could essentially do that. But then the building would be in use and essentially the restriction would be removed. Yeah, I guess I misunderstood. I meant I thought you were asking the remainder of the funds. Mm -hmm. If you're saying we can't release them as they go along, you can absolutely release them. You can release them as they're booked. It's the residual that you can't release, the extra, until it's placed in service. Okay, great. Uh, we're getting close to the top of the hour. Um, I, I want to make sure that uh, there's a couple of questions. Uh, Chad, I'm not ignoring the three-part question that you asked, but I think I'd like to maybe get it answered offline because I have a feeling that something's going to get lost in the translation <laughs> here. So, <laughs> uh, Tammy, I'm probably going to have you take a look at these questions and we can together make sure that they all got answered, if that's okay. Okay, great. Um, Great. Anything else that the two of you want to want to mention before we uh, let everybody go for the day? Just thank everyone for joining. And, and um, we want to just take a quick uh, shout out to our mission support site. So as we collaborate in this webinar, there's uh, a platform. Peter, if you want to show us that platform. I am uh, going to show you this slide at the very least. Okay, so we've got uh, an online community where uh, that we've set up. It just launched what two weeks ago, and um, it is a, a place for people to collaborate on solutions and best practices, uh, participate and share their experience, stay informed on the latest trends in industry news, and network with mission-oriented people just like yourselves. Um, it is it is not just for churches. It's not just for faith-based. It's for um, a wider nonprofit. Uh, audience, but we do have a lot of folks in there that are in church finance that are already asking questions and answering questions and collaborating. So you can visit that site at community.act2.com, which uh, provides you a way to join. Uh, Glenn, who Tammy mentioned earlier, is one of our professional services managers on our nonprofit team. Uh, you see his contact information there on your screen, and he is in charge of running that community. You're welcome to reach out to Glenn. You're also welcome to reach out directly to me with any questions about that, and I can try to answer them or get them uh, get you pointed in the right direction. And uh, beyond that, we've only got a couple minutes left, so um, I will just mention that uh, you're going to get an email tomorrow with a link to the webinar recording from today, as well as the slide deck that Carl and Tammy presented, as well as a handout from Cape and Kraus on the topic. Uh, as soon as this webinar is over, you'll be asked to complete a short survey. We would love it if everyone could complete that. We appreciate your feedback. Uh, if you are planning to get CPE credit, especially in Texas and possibly elsewhere, you'll need to fill out that survey as well. Um, and again, if you have any questions, Feel free to reach out to me, Peter Wagner, at pwagner at act2.com, or on the Vision 2 side, reach out to Charlotte Woodward at charlotte.woodward at vision2systems.com, and I will show you guys those uh, contact, inf that contact information.
And otherwise, we thank everybody for joining us. And we thank uh, Carl and Tammy so much for sharing their experience and all this great information and showing us uh, how it works in action. Thanks very much. Thanks, Peter. Thank happy, you. Happy Halloween, everybody. Take care. Bye, guys.